Hello, I see you are envious here back with another video and I am back at it again. I started my shift and I'm getting ready to start my very first medication pass. I am giving some metoprolol, some Keppra, the oral solution. And I also have another medication that I have to give tonight, and this is Solumedrol. Solumedrol is a steroid medication that comes in this uh, little weird vial that you have to engage the rubber stopper to allow the liquid that sits on top of it to mix um, with the powder solution in the glass bottle, and then it's reconstituted, and you remove the cap and cleanse it with alcohol, of course. Remember to keep that aseptic technique. Use a three milliliter syringe to then puncture the top uh, where the stopper is up underneath the cap and withdraw the medication. Just make sure whenever you're giving solumedrol that you are giving the correct dosage because sometimes a complete dose doesn't need to be drawn out of the syringe in order to accurately um, administer it to your patient. So next I'm going to the supply room to show you guys everything that is needed to be able to draw labs on your patient because where I work on my unit, we actually draw labs ourselves. Now it is actually the responsibility of the medical surgical technicians to draw blood, but of course it's everybody's responsibility. So sometimes if the uh, MSTs can't get the blood from the patient or I know the patient is a difficult stick, then I will go and get that blood myself. And then some of our patients have central lines where we can actually draw the medication out of their central line, like a triple lumen catheter or um, a PICC line, which is a peripherally inserted central um, line. So now I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about order of draw. The first thing that you draw in um, the order of draw when you have like a rainbow to draw is your blood cultures. And what you see here is a blood culture setup, which is a sterile procedure. Then you have the blue top tube, the red top tube, the gold top tube, the green top tube, the lavender top tube, and the gray top tube. And we draw things like um, lactic acids in the gray top tube. And whenever you draw a lactic acid, you have to make sure that you release the tourniquet and put that sample on ice and get it to the laboratory within 30 minutes or as fast as possible. But it needs to be within 30 minutes so that the lactic acid will be um, accurate or the result will be accurate. And we'll talk more about why lactic acids are drawn in another video, but I just wanted to give you guys the order of draw. And once you have drawn your labs, then you take it to the pneumatic tube system if you have one in your facility. And this is what our pneumatic tube system looks like. And we send it down. So for labs, this is what you need. A plastic biohazard bag, a two by two gauze, this is our butterfly needle. This is a vacutainer. And you will need alcohol swabs. And then two of the most common uh, labs that we draw are CBC and BMP on almost every patient, almost every night. And that will be a CBC will be drawn in the lavender top tube and the BMP will be drawn in the green top tube. So there you have it. Now I'm going to tell you guys a little something that I like to think of as one of the most important skills as a nurse. I oftentimes tell you guys about how um, astute I am about my head to toe assessment or my assessment skills. So as I'm sitting here, I thought about all the people who watch on YouTube, even if I don't have a lot of subscribers, the people that do, and education is one of the main things that I enjoy. Whenever you're doing a head to toe assessment on a patient, and you know you do those whenever you receive a patient, you do them at the beginning of your shift. Even if it is a transfer patient, I still do a head to toe assessment on my patient and look at every body system from head to toe. And I like to start literally at the head and go to the toe. That way I don't leave anything out. And it might seem like it's something that is very lengthy, but once you've done it for a certain amount of time, then it's almost like clockwork and it doesn't take you long at all. 
And a lot of things that I pay attention to are specific to the patients. If they came in with shortness of breath or they came in with pneumonia, well, then you know you're going to do a focus assessment, of course, on the lungs and also the oxygenation of the patient. So the first thing I do is either I or the technician I'm working with that night will obtain a set of vital signs on the patient, including their temperature, pulse, respirations, heart rate, um, well, that's the pulse, temperature, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, and their oxygen saturation. And then the last vital sign that a lot of people forget is pain. I do a pain assessment on my patient, asking them what their pain is on a scale from 0 to 10, and then asking them um, to describe their pain to me so I'll know how to further um, assess that patient. So starting with the head and face and eyes, I look at the patient's hair. Is it brittle? Is it thin? I look at the skin on the patient's face. I look at their lips and their oral mucosa. I look at their eyes and see if there's anything different about their eyes. I go onto the neck and feel around the lymph nodes and check the carotid pulses. I then move down to the chest area checking the skin on every portion of the body, um, listening to the patient's heart and lung sounds. Then I will move down uh, and listen to the person's abdominal area for bowel sounds or lack thereof, still paying attention to the skin on all of these different areas. If it's a woman, if she consents so, I will actually do a breast examination on that patient. Even patients who um, have had mastectomies, I'm careful to make sure that um, I do breast exams on those patients, even though they don't have breasts anymore. Then I move down and I pay very close attention to the hair in the pubic region of the patient, look at their genitals, make sure there's no signs of symptoms of infection, no discharge, make sure that there's no signs of sexual assault on that patient or abuse. Um, those are usually the areas where you'll see uh, signs of abuse on patients, um, areas that can be hidden by clothing. Um, go down looking at the hair on the legs. Are the legs swollen? Um, there's their hair on the patient's legs. Are they shiny, taut? Uh, do the patients have any pain in their legs? Are they able to bend their legs adequately? Looking at the joints. Um, also, checking the popliteal pulses behind the knees and checking the pulses at the ankles and on the top of the foot. Looking at the hair and um, stuff on the legs and on the ex the extremities, I look at the person's fingernails and toenails and also look at the bottom of their feet, feeling the bottom of their heels to make sure that they're not boggy. After I've done that, then I will be assisted if needed to turn the patient over and look at the patient's back and make sure that there's no areas that need attention there. Also looking at their buttocks and in between the gluteal folds and the back of the legs. And like I said, it seems tedious and it seems like a lot, but... It goes by pretty quickly. So next, I'm going to take you on a tour of a patient room because I'm getting ready to get a new patient. Um, this actually is an isolation room, so I'm in the ante room right now, but this patient's not actually on isolation, but that's the only room that we had available. So when you go into the room, here is your bed, of course, and there is your wall unit where we have our call light system and the air and oxygen there is the sink and cabinets and the needle box or the sharps container. These rooms are actually pretty big. Every room has a clock and also has an information board, as you can see there, where we write our names and we write down things like their target pain score, um, also the next time they can have their pain medication, any test or procedures, the charge nurse, the nurse supervisor, the case manager, my name, and the medical surgical technician's name. There you see more oxygen on the wall. There is the room from another angle where we have our sanitizer and soap solutions. A sign um, letting them know, please call before you fall because we definitely don't want any patients to fall. And there you see that's where we set up suction, where it says vacuum, and then where the oxygen would come out uh, for patients that receive oxygen therapy. I'll take you guys into the bathroom, which is also quite large, and you can see that red string. That's where we have the patient's pool when they are ready to come out of the bathroom, and they also have one in the shower. And that's a shower chair for patients who need a place to sit. There is our paper towel dispenser. And I am going to back out of this bathroom and I apologize for going kind of quickly, but I do have a patient come in. I just wanted to be able to show you guys this patient room. 
So I'll take you over and let you get a closer look at where the gloves are and where the sharps container is. You just place the sharp in horizontally and lift to ensure disposal. It'll go down into the sharps container. And of course, that sharps container is puncture proof to uh, reduce the risk of um, needle sticks. And now I'm going to zero out this bed. That's something very important you want to make sure that you do before you get a patient. Zero out your bed so you can accurately obtain the weight of your patient when they get there. That's particularly important for my unit because I work nephrology where my patients go to dialysis. So here, I have two medications that I use actually quite frequently on my floor because I have dialysis patients who actually sometimes have a lot of issues with their blood pressure. This is Midodrine, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. It's medication time with ICUR Envious. So the first medication that I am going to show you guys is, let's see, drum roll please. It is... Kepra. Kepra is an anti-seizure medication that comes in tablets and the syrup form. The main thing you want to work, remember with Kepra is you want to make sure you shake it very, very well. That was Metoprolol, also known as Lopressor. That is a beta blocker and in hypertensive med medication. This is melatonin. Melatonin, I think most people are familiar with melatonin. It is a three milligram tablet that helps people sleep at night. Big on the night shift. Next, I have, again, solumedrol, another patient getting solumedrol. That is a little vial that you have to engage the rubber plunger, and I'll show you how to give that in just a second. So the Minitrin that I was showing you guys before um, is a medication that helps people with low blood pressure. It brings up the blood pressure. And one of the main things that you want to make sure you do before you give a patient Minitrin is check their blood pressure just as you would um, a person before you gave them an actual blood pressure medication that lowered their blood pressure. Because if the blood pressure is um, a parameter, parameters are usually given by doctors, but if it's too high, then you might not want to give that patient the minadrin because then it'll send their blood pressure up even higher. So it is for hypotensive patients, but you do want to check that blood pressure just like you would a patient that was getting low pressor or getting low sartan to make sure that patient's blood pressure doesn't go too high. So I have uh, already engaged a little rubber stopper or plunger and I've cleaned off the top of the vial. Now you will see me Oh, no, I didn't clean it off. There you go. Cleaned it off. Remember to always maintain aseptic technique. So I'm going to open up the little um, blunt cannula there and attach it to the top of the 3 ml syringe. Pick up my vial of solumedrol and it is about one milliliter in that vial. So what I am going to do, I am going to draw back on the plunger of the syringe to one milliliter, which is the equivalent of what I am going to draw out of the bottle. And then I will remove the cap, puncture, and then inject that one milliliter of air into that vial then I will invert the bottle and withdraw the one milliliter of solution that has been reconstituted in that bottle. And as I always say, make sure you remove any air out of the top of that syringe to decrease the amount of air that you inject into the person's vein via the peripheral or central intravenous line. Recap it is a blunt tip so you don't have to do it like I showed you guys before. And there you have it. You see the one milliliter of solumedrol that has been drawn up into the syringe. So let's see what we have next. That, oh, I think I have it upside down. That is a cyclovir. Any medication that ends in VIR, you know it is an antiviral. So I have a patient that will be getting a cyclovir tonight. And that actually is the only pill that that patient got. So now let's see what else I have for you. This is 
guafenicin and dextromorphan, and then we have methamazole. That um, guafenicin is just mucinex, and the other is tapazole. This is carvedilol, which is another blood pressure medication, also known as Coreg. Next patient will be getting pravastatin sodium, which is a statin drug, which is for cholesterol. That patient got 40 milligrams times 2 because the order was for 80 milligrams. This is just absorbic acid or vitamin C, which is a supplement. My patient will also be getting this. And then I've got metoprolol tartrate, again, which you see a lot for patients with hypertension. It's a beta blocker, and it is also um, an antihypertensive medication. So now since I have this patient coming, my patient actually was going to be on IV fluids. He was going to be on normal saline solution at 75 milliliters an hour. So as you can see, I removed the bag of normal saline and checked the expiration date on it. Hang it up on the IV pole. I will take my bag of primary IV tubing and remove it from the package. I inspect my line to make sure that there aren't any puncture holes or anything in it and then roll the roller clamp down to make sure that no IV fluids comes out as soon as I spike the bag. And trust me, it does happen and it might take you a few times for that to happen to you before you realize that you got to roll that roller clamp down before you do it. So I squeeze a couple of times so that the chamber gets filled with the IV solution. And then I will unwrap the rest of the tubing and remove the cap off of the end of the IV tubing. Careful not to touch it with my hands or anything, making sure you stay aseptic. And then you grab the roller clamp and slowly roll it towards the top to allow the IV fluid to drip from the chamber down into the tubing until it reaches the end of the tubing. And there you have primed your IV tubing. So then I'll take the little bar off and open up the um, chamber. I have already turned the pump on, as you can see, and put the IV tubing in the chamber Close the chamber down. Make sure that the tube is in there good and no other size of the tubing is caught in there because that will give you an error. And at this hospital and probably at the majority of hospitals, the Alaris pumps are used um, and we always use guardrails. Even if it's for just a basic infusion, you always use guardrails. We don't um, do basic infusions because that increases the risk of um, making a mistake. So we're definitely going to use the guardrails here, even for this normal saline solution um, IV. So next, as you can see here, this is a potassium IV um, warning on my computer screen because my patient is getting ready to get potassium. So we have to make sure that the um, patient's last potassium is within um, defined limits. And that was my night. I hope you guys enjoyed it's watching. Time to go. I hear it's cold outside. Here we go. It's nice and cold out here. I use this to cover my face when it's cold because I, I don't like for my body to be cold, but I definitely can't stand for my face to be cold. You know how people say they are gonna run out of work? Well, I think that would have been a good idea this morning because maybe it would have heated me up a little bit. I have to check my tires in the morning on a cold morning to make sure that they didn't go down. Oops. Ooh. I know the seats are this morning. Slide in. Whew. Did I get gas? 
Gosh, I hope I'm not on E.